outdoors. We gotta get going here. I don't want to charge you guys overtime again. <laughs> My microphone on? There you go. Good there. Let's stand. We are in the season of Easter, the second Sunday of Easter. Uh, so we have this Easter greeting for us. Hallelujah, Christ is risen. The, um, and we will uh, begin with this Easter hymn, Thine is Glory. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Let us sing this hymn of praise, ELW 167, if you want to look at the music.
the God of life and love and freedom, praise and glory forevermore. Power and riches, wisdom and might, and honor and glory to Christ forever. and celebration all of creation sings for joy to the God of life and love and freedom praise and glory forevermore for God has come to dwell with us to make us people of God to make all and celebration all of creation sings for joy to the God of life and love and freedom praise and glory forevermore Holy God receive this worship as a sign of our love for us for the joy that the resurrection has brought to each of us and the hope that we leave today with in the name of Christ our Lord and our Savior we pray amen uh, you may be seated I think Melanie is Melanie you back there is, who's is, there she is if we have children that want to go to children's church Melanie is going to take them uh, to there there we go and we will have, um, oh, Betty's not here to read. Was Be Did anyone fill in for Betty? Well, I will read. Look at that. <coughs> Betty is visiting family in Tanzania, so she's not here. I had to read at eight, too. Just keeping score there. When you, when you see that budget come out in April, you know, you'll know. You know. So a reading from Psalm, a very short Psalm. How very good and pleasant it is when kindred live together in unity. It is like the precious oil on the head running down upon the beard, on the beard of Aaron, running down over the collar of his robes. It is like the dew of Hermon, which falls on the mountains of Zion. For there the Lord ordained his blessing. Life forevermore. The word of the Lord. Uh, a reading, um, and all through Easter, I believe we're going to be reading uh, uh, pieces from the three letters of John that are in the New Testament. This one is the very beginning of those letters, 1 John, the first chapter. So we declare to you what was from the beginning, what we have heard, what we have seen with our eyes. What we have looked at and touched with our hands concerning the word of life. This life was revealed and we have seen it and testified to it. And declare to you the eternal life that was with the Father and was revealed to all of us. We declare to you what we have seen and heard so that you may also have fellowship with us. And truly our fellowship is with the Father and with the Son, Jesus Christ. We are writing these things so that our joy may be complete. And this is the message we have heard from him and proclaim now to you that God is light and in him there is no darkness at all. If we say that we have fellowship with him while we are walking in darkness, we lie and do not do what is true. But if we walk in the light as he himself is in the light, we have fellowship with one another. And the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses all of us from our sin. If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, God, who is faithful and just, will forgive us and all of our sins and cleanse us from unrighteousness. If we say we have not sinned, we make God a liar and his word is not in us. My little children, I am writing these things to you so that you may not sin. But anyone who does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous, and he is the atoning sacrifice for our sins, 
And not just for ours only, but also for the sins of the entire world. The word of the Lord. Why don't you stand and welcome our gospel. this morning is from St. John, the 20th chapter. So this uh, lesson begins on Easter night. So last Sunday, that night is when this lesson begins. And you'll notice at the end that scholars think this might have been the original ending of John, and there's actually one more chapter, chapter 21, that has some resurrection appearances. Uh, but you can see in the ending why scholars might have thought that. So when it was evening on that day, the first day of the week, and the doors of the house where the disciples had met were locked for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. And Jesus said this, he showed them, after Jesus said this, he showed them his hands and then his side. And then the disciples rejoiced when they saw the Lord. And Jesus said to them again, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, so now I send you. And when Jesus had said this, he breathed on them. And he said to them, receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven. If you retain the sins of any, they are retained. But Thomas, who was called the twin, one of the twelve, was not with them when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, we have seen the Lord. But Thomas said to them, unless I see the mark of the nails in his hands and put my finger in the mark of the nails on my, in my hand in his side, I will not believe. So a week later, his disciples were again in the house and Thomas was with them. And although the doors were shut and locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, peace be with you. And then he said to Thomas, put your finger here and see my hands. Reach out your hand and put it in my side. Do not doubt, Thomas, but believe. Thomas answered him, My Lord and my God. And Jesus said to him, Have you believed because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have come to believe. Now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book, but these are written so that you may come to believe that Jesus is the Messiah the Son of God, and though it belie through believing you may have life in his name. The Gospel of the Lord. You, you may be seated. So on uh, Friday, I had the, um, I had the honor and, and the thrill of going to Tollgate Elementary School in Pickerington uh, to watch the first grade musical, The Little Lost Astronauts. Uh, my, uh, my grandson, Zeke, had a significant and important role as the planet Saturn in this musical. And he ran rings around the other planets. Oh my gosh, that killed at 8 o'clock, didn't it? <laughs> All morning long, you guys. Okay. The, um, when I enter elementary schools today, in all schools, I believe, I'm always struck by how security has changed from when, uh, you know, from when I taught and when I was in schools myself. And, you know, they, they've not only just restricted it to one entrance, uh, but in that entrance, there, there's a vestibule now that mostly, most schools have been remodeled to have, that you come into this vestibule, this space, it's a glass room, and, and the office is on the other side of that glass, and, 
and they have a buzzer to let you in, and they, and they can look through that glass to make a visual, okay, this is the UPS guy, we can let him in, or this is a mother we're expecting, we can let her in. Or they have an intercom, too, where they can you know, ask you why you're there and what's your business and what you hope to accomplish and that sort of thing. And then they, then they buzz you in. Uh, for the most part, I'm guessing, I, I doubt if they refuse too many people that come. Uh, and, and, and we have that system, right, because our world feels like a crazy, dangerous place. And, and, and we've seen too many horrific shootings in the news. And so these, these precious, vulnerable children are in the space, and we want to make sure we protect them. Um, and this comes to be a problem for Messiah, this, this church, because we have a wonderful school here, Messiah Christian School, a three-year-old through kindergarten, and, uh, and, and we keep our doors unlocked during the day. And, uh, and so when parents come to see our school and take a tour, they often ask about that, the accessibility that, that the world has to their children if they were to enroll them and leave them here and, and the vulnerability that makes. And, and I'm told we, we lose parents uh, or, or, or students because parents are afraid of this, which is why we've asked in our, uh, in our newsletter, and we, we try to have people volunteer for three-hour shifts, nine to three, Monday through Friday, in order to sit in that welcome center and, and be a welcoming presence for people and, and, and you know, not, not to uh, club people and knock them down to keep them out. We don't usually have, we've never had that problem, but, but, but to honestly help them find the right space. It's a complicated building, and, and we don't want them wandering through our school as they're trying to find the office or the kitchen or, or, or Jude's uh, custodial closet or something like that. So, um, and uh, because uh, people keep their places locked anymore and, uh, you know, schools and businesses and churches and, and homes. And, and usually when you lock a door, you lock a door because you're afraid of what's on the outside, right? That, that they're going to get inside and, and steal your stuff or, 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 or even worse, harm you. And, and in this broken world, that fear isn't irrational. It's founded. I don't know whether you noticed or not when we read this scripture from John, but there's a couple locked doors. In fact, when Jesus tries to find these disciples, he finds them behind locked doors every time. Uh, and, and their fear, we're told, is fear of the Jews, is how John puts it. We could put it better than that. We could say that they have a fear of the political and religious leaders that had Jesus killed. And it would be a... a, a, a a, a normal proposition to think that if these guys had Jesus killed, surely they might start working on the disciples of Jesus next. So, they, so they're locked doors to keep that, to keep themselves safe. But the locked doors are, are kind of a, a crazy contrast in my mind to what's going on in the story. <laughs> Right? They just heard the good news that Jesus didn't die, that he's alive, that, 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 that Jesus has conquered death, that goodness is greater than evil, an hallelujah moment, and they celebrate by gathering and cowering in a locked room that night. Something doesn't seem to match with the enthusiasm you would think this would bring and the reaction that they have. They're still afraid. In fact, John tells the story a little different than, than Mark that we heard on Easter. But the way John tells the story is that Mary Magdalene is the only one who sees on Easter day Jesus. And, and when she encounters Jesus, she uh, goes and tells the other disciples. And so the picture that we have at the beginning of the scripture we read today is that evening, the disciples kind of gathering in the room and, and unpacking what the day has brought and, and asking each other, what Mary said exactly, and, and maybe even Mary's in that room. There's no reason to think that she's not in that room. And, and, and her testifying and her telling and all this other, as they try to get their head around, what does it mean that Jesus lives? And they lock the doors for fear because they're afraid. And then that's where Jesus finds them. But what you need to do is keep your eyes on Jesus because Jesus doesn't let locked doors keep him away from those whom he loves. In fact, one author said that Jesus moves with the speed of love right through the door in order to encompass, grab, hold on to, encounter those disciples. 
And what I love is that he doesn't encounter them by by giving them a dope slap and saying, what are you doing in here? Get out there, right? He, he doesn't yell at them or anything else. He's, he's not disappointed in them. He knows that they're afraid and that that fear is valid, and he gives them peace. And any of you that have ever faced a surgery that had frightened you, or, or a moment in your life where you were unsure, God's peace is something that can calm us down. And give us courage. And that's what Jesus gives them. Is peace. And then he tells them to get out of there. Right? <laughs> Just as my father has sent me, I send you. Go! <laughs> the point isn't for you to be in this locked room. It's to be out into the world. And, and confront and encounter the evil that, that, that is still part of this world. That brought me to the cross. Encounter it through the power of forgiveness. That I bring to you, and now I want you to speak to your neighbor. Hallelujah, right? I mean, it's a great hallelujah moment. You, you, these disciples are all in until they're not. Right? A week later, they, they, they find themselves in a locked room again, and Thomas gets all the blame for this. He's the guy that has doubts, right? And they're gathering around Thomas. But I'm telling you what. These guys are in a locked room again a week later. I'm guessing that they got some doubts too. Even though now Jesus is gone, they're still asking questions. They're trying to figure this out. And Jesus comes in again. And now if Jesus has any right to like shake them and say, I'm getting impatient here, you would think it would be now. But he doesn't do that. With the speed of love, he goes to a locked door, confronts them in their fears, which are valid and found and, and and gives them their peace again. Shares with them his presence to leave with. Breathes on them the spirit, this spirit, this act that reminds us of Genesis. When people were brought to life by God. They're brought to life by God's spirit now. And then he sends them out again. <laughs> now go. You're not supposed to be in this locked room. You've received my peace. My spirit lives with you. Go and confront evil with the power of forgiveness. So all might know the good thing that has happened. That in the resurrection, we know that death has been conquered. So there's nothing we need to fear. Even death for us won't be the last word. So get out of those locked rooms and get out into the world. And that's our call today, right? <laughs> to get out into these locked rooms and get out into the world and, and, and bring this good news that the world is hungry to hear, confident with the power of the spirit that we leave with, with the peace that we've been given. And knowing that our message is something people want to know and hear. That there is nothing to fear. That goodness is stronger than evil and even death itself has been conquered in Jesus. Oh, that's good news that people want to hear. We should not want to be in locked rooms. And I got to be honest, this is the only time I'm saying this all morning long. But usually I tell a few stories in my thing and I go, well, Jesus, I didn't really have a story at the beginning. I need a story at the end. And, and I wrote a lovely story about... Uh, the great refugee ministry we did here, how we get out of our locked rooms and do that. But, the, you know, the more I thought about it, the more I thought, <laughs> I don't know if the world really wants us out of our <laughs> locked rooms. That, that they're a little afraid of us. And, and, and I'm, not, I'm not wading into this uh, whether Christians are persecuted in America or not. I think that's a lot more complicated than Starbucks not letting us say Merry Christmas or something. There's, there's conversation there we could have. I, I mean that whenever Christians seem to make the news, it's almost always because we're saying something ugly to someone in our world. That we are known most for wagging our fingers at other people. That, that once we get out there, uh, we, we are known to be people that, that say, you're out, you're in, you're out, you're in. 
that, that we are in front, uh, we're being interviewed on the news because we are passionate that if Jesus were alive, he'd vote Democrat, or if Jesus were alive, he'd vote Republican. Polarizing our world even more than it is already. If we scatter and leave these locked rooms, we don't want everyone else to go behind locked rooms and hide from us. And when I talk to people that aren't a part of the church, they give me an earful with that kind of stuff. It, and it doesn't surprise me that when you read polls that ask people what they, what's the word that comes to mind when they hear the word Christian, you would hope that the word would be loving or kindness or mercy. And almost always it's judgmental. Or words related to that. So if we are going to leave our locked rooms and, and, and go out into the world and, and spread this good news, then I think we might need to practice doing so where we're seen a lot more than we're heard. Because I'm not sure we are seen in our communities the way we, we, we think we might be. There, there was a study in 1999 at the Auburn Institute uh, that I found interesting. It, it said that they asked county commissioners and uh, mayors and trustees, township trustees, and they asked them, how often do you turn to the church and church leaders when you have community solve problems to solve? And it was a very low percentage that said they did. And you might think that's because they have an anti-church bias, <laughs> but they turn to the church all the time. In those communities where the church was active out in the world. And I could testify here in Reynoldsburg. When I was a, a leader at Heart Food Pantry here in our community in Reynoldsburg. And a leader at Joseph's Coat Clothing and Furniture Ministry. The city administration called me all the time to be part of task force to solve community problems. Because I was someone they saw all the time out in their community. Trying to find a better way to do things. That I don't think it's that they hate the church. I think they don't know the church. And maybe if they knew us better. And so when we get out there, then we need to be people. <laughs> that are rolling up our sleeves and helping people overcome the power of evil in this world. Without necessarily telling them why we think they did wrong to get in this evil spot in the first place. Helping people overcome the power of evil by offering forgiveness or assuring them rather of the forgiveness of God. So because people don't need to be judged, they need for others to find a way for them to get food if they've lost their job and they can't make ends meet. They need us to help them find shelter if they're Home has blown up in violence, and it's no longer safe to be there. They need us to help them find furniture if they are lucky enough to find a, a place to rent with the sky-high crazy rates that are pushing working people out of their homes. They need us to help them find a mop or a shovel or... or, or, or uh, when floods and tornadoes destroy landscapes and homes. We do need to be bold prophetic voices. I'm not saying that we need to be quietists in the world, but our bold prophetic voices should look and sound like Jesus. Jesus, the one who spoke out most for those who are on the margins of society, not the ones who are controlling the world. Bold prophetic voices that call people that are making decisions in our world to task. For the harm that they are causing and the evil that they're encouraging. Bold prophetic voices that remember that our neighbor is not just the American sitting next to us, but also those that we consider an enemy. They're our neighbor too, and we're called to love them. Bold prophetic voices that speak a word of forgiveness. And if you are a careful reader of scripture, you might be ready to raise your hand and says, Pastor, we're, uh, we're allowed to be retaining sins too, which means telling somebody, sorry, you've done something that, 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 that God just ain't going to be able to forgive. 
But when you look at what God can't forgive and you look at the role of Jesus, so you got to wonder and scratch your head, what would that be exactly? I mean, we're talking about a guy that was nailed to a cross, and on that cross he forgave the very people that put him up there. Holy cow. That is a heady responsibility to tell someone that your sins are retained. And one I would expect no Christian to take without a lot of thought and debate and wonder and humility. And if we were that sort of people when we spoke and we were already in the community serving, I'm betting people wouldn't be afraid of us when we got out there. But welcoming the good news we have to bring. Because we cannot stay in these locked rooms. And I honestly think Messiah does a wonderful job of leaving these locked rooms and going out and scattering in the world. <clears throat> because we are called not just simply to be disciples that follow Jesus. We are called to share the good news <laughs> that we have received. To share the good news in our words, in our hands, and in our feet. Because... There's a lie out there that evil is stronger than goodness. And we know the truth. Because we have experienced the resurrection in the very presence of Jesus. And we've got good news to share. Amen. We have Tyler leading us on the next one. Is he? No, you're leading it? You're leading us. Yeah, oh, yeah, okay. Well, go on. <laughs> you played it wonderfully at eight. <laughs> this is in 815. If you want to open your hymnals, I'm going to let you sit during this song.
stand and let's pray. Holy God, we give thanks for your peace that passes all understanding that has moved us out into the world. May that peace calm all of our fears. An understandable fear of death, our death and the death of our friends, death of strangers and enemies. Lord, may your peace send us out to announce the good news that in the death and resurrection, evil has been conquered and goodness is promised in the resurrection. And may that good news bring hope to all. And may we embody that hope, Lord, by who we are in our communities, how we act, how we serve, what we say. Lord, may we be a blessing for our neighbors so that they might trust the promise and the hope of Jesus and receive his peace too. We pray for those places that are disrupted by violence, homes, countries, especially in war, like in Gaza and Ukraine. Bold voices of peace speak, Lord, and help all find life. Pray for those who are sick or ill that are concerning to us. Especially, we're thinking this morning of Phyllis and Roginia and Ross and Latrenda, Kimberly, Jennifer, Karen, Teresa, Ziva, Mark, Sue, Tish, Adam, Anne. Larry, Ross, John, David, Jean, Karen, Connie, Cassie, Christine, and others named aloud now. Hear all these voices, Lord. May each be served by a child of God, a brother or sister in Christ, kneeling and taking care of them. All this we pray for in whatever else your wisdom deems that we need. We pray with the confidence of Jesus who has come into our lives so that we might go and share him with other lives. Amen. The peace of the Lord be with you always. Please share God's love and God's peace with one another. Peace, Pastor. Let's have a seat. We have some special music uh, from our worship director, Tyler, while we uh, receive the special gifts you brought for us today.
I haven't even prayed yet, and you're already clapping. <laughs> Lord, we laid before you our best gifts of, of bread and wine and wealth and talent. Uh, we trust that your presence will be made known in these gifts, that they are a good gift for heaven themselves, and that we might receive a blessing in the midst of sharing them that can be a blessing for our neighbor. Amen. The Lord be with you. <clears throat> Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is indeed right, our duty and our joy, that we should at all times and in all places give thanks and praise to you, almighty and merciful God. For the glorious resurrection of our Savior, Jesus Christ, has opened the gates of heaven for all of us so that we might die to sin and rise to the new life that has been promised. And so with Mary Magdalene and Peter and all the witnesses of the resurrection, with the earth and the stars and the sea and all the creatures, and with the angels and the cherubim and the seraphim, we praise your name and join in this unending hymn. celebrating on this Easter Sunday, the gift of the resurrection, the, the promise of new life, the hope that goodness is indeed stronger than evil. Fill our hearts with joy, Lord, and help us trust the presence that we have been promised, that when we gather around this meal, your presence is known in the way that it was known that night when Jesus breathed on those disciples. Lord, we remember the promises of Jesus, and we trust them, especially the promise he made to his disciples in the night and beast betrayed, where he took bread and broke it and gave thanks, saying, Take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And again, after supper, he took the cup, and he blessed it, and he gave it for all to drink, saying, This cup is a sign of the new covenant shed in my blood, for you and for all people, for the forgiveness of sin. Do this for the remembrance of me. For as often as we eat this bread and drink this wine, we proclaim the mystery of faith, that Christ has died, Christ has risen, Christ will come again. Come, Holy Spirit, come. Find us here, send us out there, so that all might know of the love we have received and the peace we've been brought to share. Amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. sin of the world, have mercy on us. Lamb of God, you take away the sin of the world, have mercy on us. Lamb 
Lamb of God, you take away the sin of the world. Grant us peace, grant us peace, Lamb of God. You may, oh, you're already seated, look at that. Well, you can stay seated. Uh, while we uh, have our ministers come down with this good gift. Just come back and get this then, okay? And we commune those who are at home using these communion kits and also those of you that are communing in your seats today. The body of Christ given for you. <laughs> The blood of Christ shed for you. Amen. For the rest, we'll bring this meal forward. If you're visiting today, come and eat. God hopes to meet you here at this meal. side with gracious words draw near O Christ who spoke as none e'er spoke my peace be with you here we may not touch your hands and side nor follow where you trod but in your promise we rejoice and cry my Lord and God help then O Lord our unbelief and may our faith abound to call on you when you are near and seek where you found in means divine beneath the water and the word beneath the bread and wine and when our life of faith is done in realms of clearer light may we behold you as you with full and endless light.
body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ strengthen and keep you in his grace. Amen. Lord, fed and nourished at your table, may we leave now with your peace in your presence to delight the world with the love we found. Amen. Um, a few announcements. One, those beautiful lilies, they're going to go to other people after today. So if you bought a lily, or honestly, if you just want a lily to take home, uh, feel free to come up and get one because they're, they're out of here after this. We can't have flowers any longer. We're done with them. So there we go. What else we got? Kairos Ministry is this weekend. Um, that's a prison ministry that our men are active leaders on. Uh, what, what's the prison? Southeast Correction. Southeast Correction. I asked Lloyd a, a part of that ministry. Uh, so talk about locked doors and fear and, and, and that sort of thing. There's a ministry that lives that out. And, uh, and, and recently I've been in uh, contact with a prisoner and I'm just, I, I'm just broken hearted with the seclusion and the aloneness uh, that they have in our prison system uh, by ways that, frankly, I think we make worse by some of the rules that we have. So, um, so we give thanks for these men going there. And any way you can pray and support them this weekend would be wonderful as they're there. Good work. Uh, there are some QR codes that are in your bulletin. We have that all the time now. Because some of you are smart enough to know what they are and how to use them. And, and others have first, first grade grandsons that can show them how to use them. Uh, you know, take your, cam take your camera there and take a picture of it. And, uh, and it'll send you to a website. Um, so there's there for acolytes and for greeters. The, the two I want to make sure you're aware of is especially the Kroger Fund. That's still a thing in our world. It was like a huge thing 10 years ago and PTAs and everybody else was doing it. But we still receive almost $2,000 a year in the Kroger Fund that goes to our uh, music, um, music and worship. It's a little less than that, like $1,600 or something, but it's good money. And, and, there's, and, uh, and, and we use it to buy anthems, we use it to buy instruments, we use it to buy uh, special musicians on special Sundays. Uh, here at Messiah. And if you haven't done it in a while, I would encourage you to, uh, to do it again. I should do it again. Uh, mine was 10 years ago, but maybe it's fallen off and I have no idea. And I, uh, so it wouldn't hurt to, to just go there and try it again and make sure because um, it, it's, it's found money out there that Kroger's is willing to give us. There's also one there for the malt sale. The youth are going to be doing that in a few weeks, delivering it to your home for $6 a bag. You can also simply buy it through envelopes and uh, buckets out there in the Welcome Center. This week on Tuesday is the Rebecca Circle that's happening um, in the morning. So come and join them, a nice group of ladies for fellowship. And Wednesday night we're back for our meal at 5 to 6.30. And then we've got a, a really unusual and special gift. Um, our own um, pastoral care minister, Stacy Stout, who's also a seminarian, uh, is going to come and teach a class for four weeks uh, that's from work that she's done this last seminary, this last semester in seminary. And, um, and it dovetails with her job before where she was a social worker for a police force uh, on a domestic abuse unit. And, uh, and it's uh, the church's response to sexual violence uh, in the home. And, and so... It's a kind of a step back for the church. How can we be good neighbors uh, to those who have experienced violence in their home? And, and also, how can we be good neighbors to, to those abusers? That, and, and, and what's the way to be in relationship with them that, 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 that offers opportunity? So, good questions. <clears throat> Four weeks, I'm excited to be part of it. Come and, and, and be part of it yourself. I had a big thank you in there for last week. Um, just from me, it's in your bulletin board. I'm just uh, always impressed uh, with all the volunteers and, and the staff and how hard they work. Uh, this year was especially hard, and I want to give thanks to all those musicians uh, because Tyler did not want to be sick last week, I'm sure, and, he, and he's still not feeling well today. That's why he hasn't been out here as much. Uh, but and so we had to have leaders step forward and, 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 and musicians that had to be in uncomfortable roles that they weren't expecting as it went on. And, and they just all did wonderful and gave such good gifts. So what a good, what a good place uh, this is to worship.
Thank you. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Verna. <laughs> okay, stand. It feels like I stand a lot more than you guys do during this worship service. I have to start stretching. Uh, hey, we got our Easter uh, greeting at the end, too. Hallelujah! Christ is risen! And now may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord look upon all of you with favor and grant you God's peace. Doesn't Tracy do a wonderful job? <laughs> Rejoice in the resurrection. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord. Thank you, God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Amen.